Okay, so here we are with one of our models from the lab, and we call this one the Dark Brown Muscle Man. <laughs> That's our code name for him. And uh, we're going to be looking at the human muscles uh, in several areas. We're going to start with the uh, muscles for facial expression that you have on your list. Okay, I'm going to keep my list nearby to make sure that I get every one that we're supposed to look at. So we'll start with this muscle here. This muscle is the frontal belly of the epicranius. Okay, it used to be called the frontalis muscle, uh, and you may see in books that it's also referred to as the occipito frontalis muscle. Uh, our name currently that we're using in the book is the frontal belly of the epicranius. Okay, so you'll have to check with your instructor of what their expectations are for you to name this muscle. Uh, I would say um, be as complete as possible with the name and then you never have to worry about whether it's co uh, correct. So again, it's the frontal belly of the epicranius. Okay, and this one that we're looking at here that is encircling the eye, there's a term for <clears throat> any muscle that encircles a structure that it's kind of orbiting that structure, so it's referred to as an orbicularis muscle. And whatever it's encircling, that's the second part of the name. So this particular muscle is the orbicularis oculi because it's encircling the ocular area, the eye. Okay? Then we also have the orbicularis oris, and you can actually only see half of it here but there would be another section over here that would be encircling from this side, okay? And both of these muscles allow you to kind of scrunch up uh, whatever the part of the body is that you're looking at here for the eye. This would allow you to um, kind of close and scrunch your eyes together, or lids together, I should say, eyelids together. And for the lips, this would allow you to Kind of push your lips together and make a puckering type of expression with your lips. Okay, the last muscle is the zygomaticus. There are actually several zygomaticus muscles. We usually uh, point students to this one here, which is the zygomaticus major. Okay, so you can see it's extending from the zygomatic bone to the angle of the mouth. Okay, so this is the muscle that allows you to smile. Okay, very nice muscle. Okay, then we have a couple of muscles of mastication. Mastication is the anatomical term for chewing. And we have two muscles that we can see on the lateral aspect of the head. One is the masseter. Okay, and the masseter, you can see it's attached to the zygomatic bone and zygomatic process and it's extending to the ramus of the mandible. Okay, so this is what allows you to uh, pull your molar section of your teeth together. Okay, so very important for chewing. And then we also have this muscle here which is over the temporal bone, which is appropriately named the temporalis muscle. Okay, so you can see about where the edge of this muscle is, is about where your squamous suture would be in your temporal bone. Okay, so that's another muscle of mastication. Then we have a couple of muscles in the superficial neck. The one you can see really well in this specimen is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle has its origins from the manubrium of the sternum, the medial half of the clavicle, and its insertion is on the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Okay, and this muscle is important for flexion of the neck when the two sternocleidomastoid muscles are working together. 
If you only have one contracting, that allows you to rotate your head to the side that's being contracted. Okay. We also have the scalenes present in this model. They're kind of tucked in right in here. We have a better model for that one though, so I'll show you the scalenes on that other model. Okay, let's take a look at the anterior chest wall now. This huge muscle that you see right here is the pectoralis major muscle. The pectoralis major is this gorgeous fan-shaped muscle, has origins from the clavicle, the sternum, the costal border, and the aponeurosis of the external oblique. Okay, and all of that muscle inserts at a single location on the, the um, intertubercular sulcus. Okay, and it's kind of inferior to where we see the tubercles, but it's kind of the lower end of that sulcus. Okay, so we've got this, all of that force from this muscle kind of being directed right to this single location. Okay, and that gives us a lot of ability uh, to move the upper limb with this muscle. Okay, so this muscle, the pectoralis major, is our prime mover for flexion at the shoulder. It's also going to be a synergist for adduction and medial rotation of the arm at the shoulder. Okay, now if we removed this muscle, we would see deeper this smaller muscle here, which is the pectoralis minor. And the pectoralis minor has its origins from ribs three through five. It sometimes has a little bit of connection to rib two, as you're seeing here, but it's definitely ribs three through five. And it has insertion via a tendon to the coracoid process. Okay, and uh, the pectoralis minor allows us to um, elevate the ribs during uh, respiration when we need a larger thoracic cage for, for uh, taking a deep breath. It also, when it's pulling at its uh, insertion, can help to move the scapula anteriorly and inferiorly. Okay. Now let's switch to the anterior abdominal wall. And this is the only model in the lab where you can really see all four uh, anterior abdominal wall muscles very well. Okay, so we'll start near the midline. Here's the midline here. And the umbilicus or belly button is right here. There's your xiphoid process. So you can see all those midline structures. And the muscle that would be basically right here where I have the probe on each side of the midline is the rectus abdominis muscle. Okay, so the rectus abdominis muscle has its origins from the pubic bones at the pubic symphysis and it inserts to the xiphoid process and the costal cartilages of ribs five through seven. Okay, and when this muscle contracts, or I should say when these two muscles contract together, that allows you to kind of bend from your waist, so you're flexing uh, along your anterior abdominal wall and flexing your vertebral column. Internal oblique, origins from the lumbar fascia, iliac crest, I knew something didn't sound right, iliac crest, remember that's where you put your hands when they're on your hips, and then from the inguinal ligament, okay, and the inguinal ligament is basically this structure right here. Okay, that if somebody has an inguinal hernia, it's because there's a piece poking out past their inguinal ligament. So in addition to all the aponeuroses fusing at the midline, they also kind of roll together here where your trunk meets your leg. Okay, and when they roll together, that actually forms a tube-like structure and material can pass through that tube. That's actually how um, structures get uh, some structures get out of the abdominal cavity and into uh, the re reproductive structures in the male is through this 
inguinal canal, as it's called. So the inguinal ligament is this structure right here. It's ex essentially extending from the anterior superior iliac spine down to the pubic bones. Okay, so again, internal oblique, origins, lumbar fascia, iliac crest, inguinal ligament. Okay, its insertions are the linea alba, the pubic bone, and the costal cartilages of ribs 10 through 12. Okay, and like the external oblique, this muscle is also important for trunk rotation and lateral flexion. So the two of them really work as a team. The last muscle is the transversus abdominis. And the transversus abdominis is the deepest of these three muscles or the most internal. It has origins from the inguinal ligament, which we saw here again, the iliac crest, the cartilages of ribs 7 through 12, and the lumbar fascia, which is on the posterior side. And it inserts on the pubic bone and the linea alba. Okay, so it's the one that's kind of wrapping this way. Okay, so its fascicles would be oriented fairly horizontally as you're looking at that. And if you get a close up here of the image of the muscle, you can see those fascicles and the way they're oriented. Okay, and the main job of the transversus abdominis is related to the overall function that these muscles have of compressing the abdominal contents. Okay. So just to give you a little overview of how you can recognize these in addition to the layering. When you're looking at the lines on the muscles, okay, they're all going to have a slightly different orientation. The lines associated with the rectus abdominis are fairly vertical, okay, because that's what it's, the orientation of its fascicles are. The lines on the transversus abdominis are horizontal to reflect the arrangement of its fascicles. The lines on the internal oblique are oriented so they're running superiorly toward the midline, so they're kind of starting at the iliac crest and moving toward the xiphoid process this way. Okay, and the orientation for the external oblique is going to be the opposite, okay, as if you're extending from the costal border toward the pubic bone. Okay, the analogy I gave students in class for the external oblique was to think about putting your, uh, either your hands into your pockets or putting your thumbs into your pockets and the direction that your fingers would be pointing uh, in either case would be the direction that the fibers would be running or the um, fascicles would be running in the external oblique. Okay. So we'll move on to the next model.